Okay, so we are here for part two of chapter one. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. All right, so here we are. Did I skip one? I don't know, I can't tell. Hold on, no, okay. Okay, so another part that is super, super important um, about being a social worker is the strengths perspective. And you can tell that I think it's important because I put a bunch of stars on it. Um, so if I had to pick one thing that I feel like is most important as a social worker, I think what I would pick is this. So when you're working with people and there is sort of by definition, an issue that needs to be resolved. Um, the, it is rarely effective to focus on the thing that, that needs to be fixed. It is, it is very difficult to, to find motivation in, um, in addressing an issue when you are focused only on what is going wrong. It is much more effective to look at the whole situation and to find the strengths in it. Um, it might be difficult to find the strengths in it. Um, however, if you don't, you can't leverage them to work on the areas of improvement. So, you know, it might very well be that there are just not a ton of things to focus on that that can be used to help you get whatever work done that you need to get done. However, um, there is always something. There is always something, um, you know, and don't just focus on the individual and what strengths they bring, right? Like that's why we have this whole conversation about the larger environment and you know the different the different systems around the the individual, you know, the whole their whole ecological framework, right? Because you will find strengths in all of those levels that you can leverage to change. So this is, this is, as I said, kind of the most important um, aspect. All right. So um, empowerment is probably the second one, right? So don't make the mistake of taking over. When you are working with somebody to work to solve an issue, um, it is, it is both your job and your duty to make sure that that person has as much of their personal agency intact as possible. It is their responsibility with your assistance, but their responsibility to make changes. You know, they might not have all the tools that they need. They might not know how to do it. They might know, not, might not know exactly what to do first. They might not have the skills to, to do it, but it is, it is important to make sure that while you're assisting, that, they're, that you're not doing more work than they are, right? So if you're working harder than your client, they're not empowered. Right. If you are if you are spending all this time, you know, finding resources, making sure and following up and just doing all all this work to make sure that they're, you know, getting through their case plan or something, that person is not empowered. You're empowered. That's not how social work is supposed to be. So, you know, and and this is important also. Um, social workers who forget this and who and who don't um, work towards the empowerment of their clients end up overworked. First of all, you know, you you just there is no social work job anywhere where if you take on all of the work that you um, that you're going to have time to do everything. So there's that, but also um, you're going to end up burned out really fast. 
you're going to end up feeling like, you know, no amount of effort that you put in is going to result in, in, you know, a positive outcome for everybody. And this is a boundary issue too. And we're going to talk about that quite a bit, but, you know, like it's, it's important both for you as a professional and also for your client as somebody who's trying to solve an issue um, to, to make sure that they are empowered. All right. Okay, so diversity perspective. You know, this has this has changed quite a bit over over recent years. You know, that it's I think that that there's there's often a kind of knee jerk um, desire to pretend like you know the the cultural differences between between folks don't matter when you're working together with them in this sort of social work professional context. Um, they do matter, and they should not be be by any means ignored. Right. So our our cultural context, you know, our social context is part of us as we've been discussing this whole lecture. Right. So. It's it's absolutely critical that we that we at least at least at least acknowledge that um, that that aspect exists and that if we come from different social and cultural contexts, which of course we do, even if we come from from the same kind of same kind of context on a lot of different levels, there are going to be small differences unless they're your family member, in which case you shouldn't be working with them anyway, right? So, um, you know, we, we need to be able to acknowledge them. And the next step of that is not just acknowledgement, but also like an attempt to kind of like understand you're not going to ever be able to, you know, have complete empathy. You're not always, you're not ever going to be able to put yourself in their shoes in a way that, that makes it, um, that makes this not an issue by any means, but you, um, you are going to be able to at the very least approach it with some some humility and to ask questions and again to empower that client to be able to have a conversation with you about um, about what their their context is you know and and so if you lead with curiosity then that that is um, a very big step towards taking a diversity perspective Okay, so the power of language. Um, you know, people first language is is a sticky topic. Um, and the bottom line of why it's a sticky topic is that people are different. And people have different um, preferences about the language that, um, that they use for themselves and the language that we use for them. And I think that it is always um, important to remember that that because people are different, we again, we need to lead with curiosity. We need to always ask about and use the client's preferred language unless it's blatantly offensive, right? So for some of the work that I have done um, has been sexual assault work. And um, this is very this is a very salient issue, right? When you're say on a crisis hotline with with um, somebody who has experienced sexual assault, and you want to be very careful to use the language that they're using because you might you might know the legal definition of sexual assault um, inside and out, and you know, but if the person that you're talking to on the phone is saying you know, I, I had bad sex, right? And, and you say you were sexually assaulted, that, that you, are, you are taking that client somewhere where they didn't wanna go, right? So again, that's not, that's not a client empowered um, way to approach it. So, you know, the power of language is super important and you are not gonna, you're not a mind reader. You're not gonna know necessarily what what each person um what their preferred language is but again it's not your 
it's not your place to decide that for them. If they ask you, sure, you know, say like, you know, my preference is for this language because X, Y, Z, right? And of course your preference is always going to be for that per that person first language, but um, it's not it's not up to you. You know, what, what it's up to the client and it's always, it's, it's always their case, right? So we can, we can, we can influence it. We can lead it. We can explain why, you know, person first language and all of the, the arguments for person first language are explained in detail in your book. And I, I really think that you should um, read those carefully, but you know, we can explain all of that, but in the end, it's their decision. All right. So, um, going back a little bit to the social work, um, you know, the National Association of Social Workers, there is a whole list of values and ethics with, um, with regard to what the expectations are for social workers. And, you know, I, I have added some some things to these um, that that I think are important, and I'm not going to to read off the slide to you, but you know there there are a couple of things that I want to emphasize here. So, you know, I've been a social worker for a long time, and you know the primary goal is always to help people in need and to address social problems. And the reason why I put not your own here is that occasionally you will meet somebody in a human service field where it feels to you as though their goal isn't so much about the client as much as it is about like meeting their own needs for whatever it is, for rescuing people, for, you know, being needed for whatever. And I would encourage you um, that if you recognize yourself in that statement, not that you should seek another field, not that, but that you should um, examine that really carefully because folks who, who come at it from that perspective often find that they become over-invested in the work, that, they, um, that they're very prone to burnout, that they're very prone to boundary issues, that they're very prone to kind of everything that can go wrong in social work um, in a way that can harm you as an individual and more importantly, can harm the client. Right. So the best social workers are ones who are compassionate, but who have really strong boundaries and understand that the that the goal of the work that they are doing is to do the work is to do the work for the client and that it's not about them as a person. It's not about the social worker. So the other thing on this slide that I want to emphasize is that, um, you know, one good way that you know that you're headed towards burnout is that you um, you find yourself wanting to gossip about your clients, you know, that you're feeling frustrated enough that you want to turn to your colleague and, and say, you know, oh, I'm so frustrated by this person. Did you hear about this thing that happened? Like, whatever. If you find yourself in that position, um, it's time to examine what what needs to happen for you in your own life so that you can get a little bit of distance from it so that it doesn't make you um, so emotionally invested, right? So remember that your clients have problems. They as people are not problems, right? Remember that, that they have the issue. They are not an issue themselves. Okay, so um, go back again to the, the system um, concept of this whole thing. And what we're talking about here is that it's impossible to make changes without the support of, of the people around you, of like changes to the environment around you. And 
worse than that, counterproductive relationships, counterproductive environments can sabotage your progress, right? So not only is it important to be able to leverage the strengths, but it's also important to understand what is going on in the environment that is, that is impeding progress. Okay. So um, the thing that's important here is, I mean, they're both important, but the, the thing that I starred here is that, you know, social work hasn't always been seen as an evidence-based field, right? Um, it has sometimes been seen as sort of this mushy thing where people go in and they hold hands and, and they say, you know, what can we do to help? And, and there's not a lot of science or research behind it. And we have to work to change that. That has to be different. It cannot, um, it cannot be that in 2021, we are using interventions that don't have an evidence base behind them. You know, we, we have to be able to, to know at least, if not how to conduct research, right? Because we're not necessarily going forward for a PhD, right? But, but how, how to be able to read the research, how to be able to interpret the research so that we can tell what is an evidence based intervention, something that, that we know works with folks, right? Like whether it will work with this particular person or not, you don't know. But, you know, if you don't have, if you don't have a working understanding of science, if you don't have a working understanding of, of how um, research is conducted, if you don't understand, you know, what um, what a strong evidence base is versus no evidence base or a weak one or whatever, you're going to be at a real disadvantage. So, you know, this stuff has to be at the core of what we do. Okay, so, all right. So just sort of as a recap, you know, we, we wanna make sure that our professional values guide us that um, that the clients are are driven by their own desire to grow and change, that we are respecting them on all levels, but also around you know privacy and their confidentiality. Um, that and I, I sort of mentioned this flippantly earlier that we are avoiding conflicts of interest. So no, you're not going to be working with your your own family member, right? And that we we use our professional colleagues. To, to help us, you know, not just grow and change and, and become better social workers ourselves, but to make sure that we're maintaining our own um, appropriate boundaries and, and professionalism. Okay, here's some of the careers and you can see some of these in your book as well. Um, all right, so like I said, the blue is what I have added and the black is what the publisher left, right? And so, you know, the publisher wants to ask you, do you have a strong interest in one of these areas? But I have to say, that's not really required. <laughs> uh, when, I was, when I was finishing graduate school, um, I was working in a, um, a mental health context for my internship. And um, the, the person who was supervising my internship basically sent me out on an interview to a uh, foster family agency. And I didn't know a thing about foster children or the child welfare system at all. I didn't know anything about it at all. And, um, and anyway, so he sent me out on this interview and um, and I and I basically said to the woman, I know nothing about any of this. And she said, that's no problem. You we will train you um, if you're interested in it. Great. You'll stay if you're not interested in it. OK, that's fine. You can move on. No problem. So that was the beginning of, you know, 15 years in child welfare. I, I didn't necessarily have any interest in it at all when I began I just sort of stumbled into it and it turned out that I loved it so it does not necessarily require that you have a strong interest in in any of the in the areas on the previous slide but you know that you keep an open mind is probably the most important thing um but the thing that actually is required is that you have personal characteristics that are 
suited to social work practice. So if you have really poor boundaries, you're probably not suited to social work practice. If you are extremely disorganized, you are also going to have a really, really hard time being a good social worker. If you are somebody who is very judgmental, you're gonna have a hard time being a good social worker. On the flip side, if you, um, if you are a very nimble thinker, so if you're somebody who thinks on your feet, solves problems really quickly, comes at things with curiosity, if you're very willing to, to work flexibly with folks, if you're, um, if you're willing to, to see the person in front of you instead of like the, the write up about everything that might have been wrong with them, then maybe this is the field for you. Okay. So I've added a couple here, right? So um, as I discussed just a little bit, organization and respect for deadlines, super, super, super important when you are a social worker. It is just really mission critical that you, even if you're not by, by nature, a super organized person or somebody who respects deadlines, there is not a social work job on earth that doesn't require that you that you have strong skills in these areas so you can develop them it, it doesn't it i'm not trying to say that if you don't have that right now that you're doomed i'm not saying that at all what i'm saying is is that it's it's something that if you don't always want to be playing catch up if you don't always want to be making mistakes and letting things go and having to go back and fix things all the time sometimes to the detriment of your clients um, it, it's something that you need to work on. Okay, so um, being a change agent, right? So we've talked about all of this stuff already. Um, all right, so if you have any questions, um, please come to Zoom office hours on Friday from five to six, or you can send me an email. And um, if you need anything explained in more detail, I am more than happy to do that. So um, until chapter two, thank you so much, everybody.